there are some general procedures that apply to most types of safety valves. We'll look at typical procedures for the disassembly and inspection of a two-ring huddling chamber safety valve that has been removed from service and taken to a shop for repairs. First, prepare the work area. Gather all the necessary tools and check the valve's nameplate data so you can locate reference material and order new parts. Clean the outside surfaces of the valve. Cleaning makes the valve easier to handle. It also prevents dirt and corrosion particles on the outside of the valve from getting inside when the valve is taken apart. To begin disassembling the valve, you must remove the release lever assembly. First, take out the cotter pin that locks the pivot pin in place. Then pull the pivot pin out. As each part is removed, set it aside in a safe place so it won't get damaged. Next, take off the release lever and then the cap that protects the top of the stem from getting dirty or being bent. Then, break the lifting nut and the lock nut free. Turn them off the stem and set them aside. The next part to be removed is the compression screw. The compression screw is precisely adjusted to maintain the exact amount of tension on the valve spring that's needed for the valve to function correctly. For this reason, you should carefully measure the screw's position. Write the measurement down so you can refer to it later when you reassemble the valve and must return the screw to its original position. Now break free the lock nut that holds the compression screw in place and turn the nut to back it out of the yoke. Then lift the lock nut and the compression screw off the stem and set these parts aside. First, break the yoke nuts free and remove the nuts from their studs. Then lift the yoke off the valve body. Handle the yoke carefully so that it doesn't bang against the studs or the stem and perhaps damage them. Remove the spring and the spring washers from the yoke and set them aside. The next parts to be removed are the stem and the disc. In this case, the two parts are connected, so they're removed together as a unit. Lift the parts straight up out of the valve body to prevent the disc from banging against the sides of the casing and being damaged. Separate the parts by unscrewing the disc from the stem. Set the disc aside carefully with its seating surface up so it isn't damaged by contacting the surface of the work table. Place the stem on V-blocks to protect it from being dropped or otherwise damaged. Now you can remove the upper and lower adjusting rings. The positions of the rings are critical to proper valve function so you must take measurements to record their exact locations. Measure and record the position of the upper ring first. Then cut and remove the locking wire that's on the upper and lower ring locking pins. The locking pins fit into notches in the upper and lower adjusting rings. Break the upper locking pin free and remove it from the valve body. Then unscrew the upper adjusting ring and set it aside. Now, repeat these steps to remove the locking pin for the lower adjusting ring and measure the exact position of the ring. Insert a screwdriver through the lower locking pin hole and unscrew the ring by turning each notch past the pin hole until the ring is flush against the rigid rule that was placed on the valve seat to take the measurement. Count each notch as it moves past the pin hole while the ring turns. Write down the total number of notches that you counted. This number will be used to install the ring correctly when the valve is reassembled. Remove the rule and unscrew the lower ring until it disengages from the threads on the valve body. Then set the ring aside. Finally, follow your facility's procedures or the valve manufacturer's recommendations to clean all the disassembled parts. We'll look at the disc first. Check it carefully for cracks. Even the smallest crack can rapidly become large enough to allow a valve to leak. A disc that's cracked must be replaced. 
Dye penetrant testing is one way to locate surface cracks and flaws in the disc and other valve parts. To do this, first clean the disc. Then apply the dye penetrant oil, which is a mixture of light penetrating oil and dye. After allowing time for the dye penetrant oil to be drawn into surface cracks, wipe the excess oil off with a clean cloth. Then apply a light mist of a dye penetrant surface cleaner on a cloth. And use this cloth to clean off the disc. Only the dye and the cracks will remain. Now, coat the surface of the disc with a developer, which is a substance that draws the dye back out of the cracks. Any cracks or flaws that are present show up in the developer. Also check the disc for steam cutting. If steam cutting is severe enough to allow leakage, you'll have to replace the disc. But if the damage is relatively minor, you can often restore the surfaces by lapping them. You'll need to follow the appropriate lapping method for the shape of the disc. If the damage isn't severe, you can probably restore the surface of the seat by lapping. As with the disc, you must use the appropriate lapping method for the shape of the part. When you're done lapping, clean all traces of lapping compound off the valve seat and all other internal surfaces of the valve. Then wipe any remaining residue off with a clean cloth. Now, use a light or bluing to inspect the clean seat for any nicks or uneven spots. If you find such imperfections, you'll need to repeat the lapping process until the surface is smooth and even. A valve seat may, however, be so severely damaged that you can't restore its surface by lapping. If the seat is a permanent part of the valve body, you can often use a reseating tool that's specifically designed to restore the damaged surface, or, as in this case, you can mount the valve in a lathe and remachine the seat. However, keep in mind that extensive maintenance on a valve seat may also affect other valve components and valve specifications, such as the lift. Next, check the adjusting rings for nicks, cracks, damaged threads, and steam cutting. Inspect them carefully, because any damage might cause them to fail when the valve is returned to service. Damaged adjusting rings should always be replaced. It's also important to check the straightness of the valve stem because a bent stem is a common cause of valve malfunctions. A bent stem can prevent a valve from opening or it can keep an open valve from reseating properly when system pressure returns to normal. Two common causes of bent valve stems are careless handling and improper gagging. Gagging is the act of attaching a device called a gag to a safety valve to keep the valve from opening. Gagging is usually a preparation for the testing that's done before a reassembled valve is returned to service. Proper gagging procedures are covered in the part of this topic that's entitled Reassembly and Testing. A common way to test a stem for straightness is to take a runout reading with a dial indicator that's mounted on a magnetic base. With the stem set up on a pair of V-blocks, place the dial indicator beside the stem and secure the dial indicator's base in position. Next, press the stem of the dial indicator against the surface of the valve stem until the dial indicator's stem retracts about one-fourth of its length. Set the dial indicator to zero to provide a reliable reference point for the reading. Rotate the valve stem slowly while you watch the dial. Be careful not to bump the valve stem or the dial indicator. Compare the maximum change in the reading on the dial indicator with the specifications given by the manufacturer. If the runout is within the specifications, you can reinstall the valve stem. But if it isn't within the specifications, this indicates there's an irregularity in the shape or the straightness of the valve stem, and you must replace it. Also inspect the valve stem carefully for cracks and other signs of damage. The end of the stem that fits into the disc must be smooth and round. Because it acts like a ball and socket joint inside the disc, 
so that the disc can align itself properly with the valve seat without damaging the stem. Flat spots on the disc end of the stem can cause uneven contact and unwanted friction between the stem and the disc. If either the stem or the disc is replaced or has any flat spots, you must lap the two parts together. This lapping process is called grinding in. Apply a thin layer of abrasive compound to the end of the stem and use a rotary motion to grind the stem into the disc. The grinding in continues until smooth, even contact is obtained between the stem and the disc. After a safety valve has been disassembled and its internal components have been inspected, the valve must be properly reassembled and tested before its return to service. The valve reassembly procedure is basically the reverse of the disassembly procedure, but there are a few tasks specifically associated with reassembly that you should be aware of. One of the first steps in safety valve reassembly is making sure that you have all the correct replacement parts and that the parts are in perfect condition. Lubrication is also an important part of reassembling a safety valve. You should follow the valve manufacturer's specifications for the exact type of lubricant and the method you should use to apply it. Typically, an anti-seizing compound is used to lubricate threaded surfaces so they won't stick together or seize as a result of temperature changes during valve operation. Also, during reassembly, it's absolutely critical that the disc and the valve seat make perfect contact so steam can't leak through the valve. Once you've completely reassembled a safety valve, you must test it to make sure that it's working properly before you return it to service. As with all other aspects of safety valve maintenance, you must follow your facility's procedures or the manufacturer's instructions for the specific valve that you're testing but we can cover some general concerns that apply to most valve testing situations. Before you can test the valve, you must reinstall it. Take the appropriate safety precautions and follow your facility's procedures to make sure that the installation is done correctly so you prevent leakage and other problems. Next, prepare to perform the necessary tests. An important preparation for many testing procedures is gagging the valve. Gagging involves installing a device called a gag that keeps the safety valve from opening during testing. We'll look at a typical procedure for installing a gag on a two-ring huddling chamber safety valve. The valve's release lever and the protective cap have been removed so the top of the valve stem is exposed. Now, align the stem of the gag properly with the valve stem. Then, attach the jaws of the gag firmly to the yoke to prevent the gag from slipping. Finally, tighten the gag finger tight only. Never use a wrench on a gag. Gagging a valve improperly can be disastrous. Damaged valve parts or serious injuries can result if a gag were to slip and the valve open unexpectedly. So, it pays to keep in mind some basic safety tips about gagging. Never apply a gag to a cold valve that will be heated. The valve stem expands considerably as temperature increases, and if the stem isn't free to expand, it will be bent. Never leave a gag on a safety valve during normal system operation, because a gag makes a valve inoperative, and the system or equipment that the valve is installed on will be unprotected. Finally, many plant systems contain several safety valves. When you test the popping pressure of any of these valves, you must gag the valves that are set to open at a lower pressure than the valve that's being tested. For example, assume that a system contains these three safety valves. Valve A is set to open at 1400 PSI. Valve B at 1450 PSI and valve C at 1500 PSI. If you're going to test valve C, you must gag valves A and B because the popping pressures of A and B will be exceeded during the test of valve C. 
Safety valve testing typically includes testing popping pressure. Popping pressure can be tested either by raising system pressure or by using an auxiliary device such as a hydraulic jack to lift the stem. If you use system pressure to test the valve, you should first lift the valve by hand to warm it. This helps ensure that the metal parts of the valve are at the same temperature before you start testing the valve to check its popping pressure. The parts will then expand and contract at the same rate during the test. In any case, when you're testing popping pressure, you're checking whether the valve opens when it's supposed to. If it opens too soon or too late in relation to the valve set point, you must make adjustments. For this huddling chamber safety valve, you make set point adjustments by turning the compression screw. But before you can do that, you must lower the pressure so that there's no chance of the valve's opening accidentally while you're working on it. You must also break the lock nut free. If you try to turn the compression screw without loosening the lock nut, you'll probably damage the screw. Which way you should turn the screw depends on whether the valve is opening too soon or not soon enough. For example, if the valve is opening too soon, you should tighten the compression screw by turning it clockwise to increase tension on the spring. On the other hand, if the valve is opening too late, you should back the screw off a bit by turning it counterclockwise to relieve some of the tension on the spring. After you've adjusted the compression screw, test the valve again to see if it's been set properly. Usually, you need to make several adjustments and tests to fine-tune the set point of the valve. If testing indicates that blowdown has been changed, you'll need to readjust it. To make blowdown adjustments of this huddling chamber safety valve, you must raise or lower the adjusting rings until the blowdown is within specifications. Safety valves may also be affected by hydrostatic testing that's done on the system or equipment that the valves protect. A hydrostatic or hydro test is done to determine whether or not the system can tolerate excessively high pressure in case of an emergency. It also helps you detect leaks. Hydro tests are often performed at system operating pressure and below safety valve set pressure. But in some cases, during hydro testing, system pressure is raised above the normal popping pressure of the safety valves in the system. Then, gags must be installed on the valves before the hydro test is begun. If the gag on a safety valve is properly aligned and tightened, the valve won't leak during hydrostatic testing. But if the gag isn't installed properly, the valve will lift slightly during the test and sizzle. If this occurs, you should reduce system pressure until the valve closes. Then you should adjust the installation of the gag. Trying to pinch off leakage by tightening the gag without lowering the pressure could damage valve parts. After you complete a hydrostatic test, you should remove the gag when system pressure has been reduced to 85 to 90 percent of the valve set pressure. Never leave a gag on a valve during normal system operation because a gag makes a valve inoperative and leaves the system or equipment that the valve's installed on without the necessary protection from excess pressure buildups.